Welcome to uh, this webinar uh, about soft power in times of war. Um, following the Russian invasion of Ukraine, the subsequent political and public debates in Denmark has increasingly in revolved around matters of security and defense politics. Discussions and debates are debating military and multilateral political alliances uh, ever, ever more. Um, and they are taking place in the Danish parliament. They're taking place in public and private spheres all over the country. So in this time of war, one might ask what happened to diplomacy and could one claim the failure of diplomatic relations? The increased uh, focus on hard power me mechanisms such as military capabilities and economic sanctions has overshadowed soft power mechanisms such as long-term value-based and cultural diplomacy, sometimes also known as uh, public diplomacy. So with that in mind, we also need to remember that the relationship between hard power and soft power is not necessarily seen as a schism, but rather as an intertwined spectrum of multilateral and global systems of diplomatic interconnectivity. So uh, with that short introduction, we're happy to welcome you to today's webinar about the theoretical and practical perspectives regarding what soft power is and why it matters even or especially in times of war. To help us delve into this important topic, we have some very knowledgeable panelists with us today. So we're very happy to welcome, first of all, the CEO of the Danish Cultural Institute, Camilla Mautpost. And uh, just to give a little background, the Institute has cultural diplomatic missions across the world, including Beijing, New Delhi, Istanbul, Sao Paulo, Riga, and formerly, due to recent circumstances, St. Petersburg and Kiev, where the uh, Ukrainian Danish Youth House was supposed to be officially opened around a month ago, um, all the way from Greece. As a representative from the Danish Ministry of Foreign Affairs, we have with us Ambassador uh, Klaus A. Holm, who is also the former head of the office department in the same ministry working with press communication and public diplomacy. And last but not least, all the way from UK, the United Kingdom, we have with us political advisor and founder of the Good Country Index, Simon Anholt. Simon has advised a uh, numerous amount of governments and ministries of foreign affairs around the world and has recently launched the book, The Good Country Equation. So uh, with that, I would like to say a big thank you to all of you for being online with us this evening. And um, I, I would like to kick off the debate with a rather large question for, for Simon. Um, what is the good country index? And how did Denmark end up ranking as second? And, and why does that matter when we discuss international uh, diplomatic relations? Um. Well, thanks, thanks for the question, uh, William. I should always explain when I'm speaking in front of Danish audiences that despite my surname, I have nothing to do with your lovely island. Uh, I had Dutch grandparents who happen to have the same name. Um, so my, I guess my answer to your question uh, starts by making a bridge between soft power and national image. I guess that's the most important thing to establish first and foremost. The work that I was doing back in the 1990s uh, ended up showing that national image was a very significant driver of um, national success in many different ways. To put it very simply, the countries with powerful and positive images traded at a premium. Everything they wanted to do, and I use the term traded in a very broadest sense, not just economic trade, but cultural trade, diplomatic trade, social trade, and so on and so forth. If you've got a good, powerful, positive national image, Everybody likes you. Everybody wants to do business with you. Everybody wants to invest in your economy. Everybody wants to hire your people. If on the other hand, you, when I say you, I'm in a country, are unlucky enough to have a weak or a negative image, everything is difficult and everything is expensive. And getting people to invest, getting people to visit uh, is twice as hard. 
So the citizens of countries with poor images quite literally spend more taxes on trying to generate foreign income uh, than the countries with, with, with good images. And back in 2005, I started doing an annual survey of national images together with my research partners who are now uh, the international company Ipsos Mori. We interview 60,000 people around the world every year and ask them a series of uh, quite detailed questions about their perceptions of 60 different countries. And it's really as simple as that. We just measure people's perceptions of countries. Whether those perceptions are true or false is of course an entire other issue. Uh, very often they're false, very often they're out of date, but that doesn't mean they're not important because people's perceptions of countries are what increasingly drive their behavior towards those countries. And because there are so many countries, more than 200, most people around the world know very little about the facts. They know very little about who's actually in power in, every, in any given country. They know very little about the geography or the history or the policies of that country. What they know is their prejudices. And this was why uh, I coined the awful phrase nation brand um, back in the 1990s, because I wanted to make this parallel between the brand images of companies, which are very superficial, very trivial, very simple, they're very easy shorthands for the way that companies and products are. And I wanted to transfer this phrase onto countries um, in a rather sad way. We tend in a globalized world to see countries in the same way. We reduce them to very simple stereotypes. So um, Denmark is a Scandinavian country, therefore it has certain qualities of order, prosperity, justice, and so forth. France is a stylish country, American is a, America is a powerful country, um, uh, England is a posh country, uh, or whatever you want to say. Those are the stereotypes, and those are what govern our view of the world. So although in a sense they're very childish and they're very reductive, they are extremely important. And governments need to understand these images because they are the drivers of the way that the world increasingly treats countries. Now, one of the things that I discovered very early on from my research is that it is almost impossible to change the image that a country has. These images take generations, decades to build and generations and decades to change. There are very, very few examples of this. And the only examples I've ever seen of countries' images changing within a short period, by which I mean less than 10 years, it's always downwards. If you try really, really hard, it is actually possible to damage the image of a country. It's not easy, but you can do it. And I'm hoping that uh, Klaus is going to tell us a little bit about the, the famous cartoons episode. Uh, I don't know anybody who knows more about that fascinating um, experience than Klaus does. But that's one example uh, which shows that if you're really determined to, you can actually damage the image of a country. Denmark's image in the Muslim world remains damaged to this day. Um, according to the surveys, which I still run every year. Now, what does that actually mean? What it means is that most people have very little knowledge or understanding of what countries do domestically, but they do have a sense and they are quite interested in how countries affect the international community. What they do, in other words, their impact outside their own borders. And back in about um, 2012, I did a large analysis of the accumulated database of the Nation Brands Index, which by that stage was over a billion data points, to try to find what is actually the main driver of a positive image. I, I knew that it wasn't propaganda. Countries that spend a lot of money bragging about how wonderful they are do not achieve any change in their image. It simply doesn't produce anything. It's a complete waste of money. Propaganda is only possible in the domestic environment. If you're Vladimir Putin or you're Kim Jong-un, and you control the only narrative, eventually people will start to accept that narrative. But internationally, nobody has ever been able to control any narrative. And the more money that countries spend on trying to project a particular image of themselves, the more um, uh, feedback, kickback, there is against that propaganda attempt. So deliberately manipulating the image of your country by using marketing communications, public relations, logos, slogans, advertising campaigns, there is simply no evidence that that works. It's just a gigantic waste of money. So the purpose of my analysis of the Nation, of the Nation Brands Index was to try and discover, so what does affect a country's image? Since it's such a valuable thing, how can you make it better? Or indeed, how could you make it worse? 
And it turns out that the single most powerful driver of a country's positive image is not its success. It's nothing to do with how rich it is or how powerful it is or how the size of its population or the beauty of its landscape or the power of its culture. It is more than any other factor, the perception that that country contributes something to the world outside its own borders. In other words, a country that appears to be working hard to tackle the things that we all worry about, the sustainable development goals, uh, climate change, pandemics, conflict, and all the rest of it. That's what people care about these days. And the only reason why anybody would admire one country more than another, generally speaking, is because they believe that that country is a more principled player in the international community. And the only reason why somebody would change their mind, or at least on a larger scale, why people would change their minds about countries is because they believe it's not contributing to a happy and peaceful international environment. In other words, do I feel glad that Denmark exists? If the answer is yes, then I like Denmark and I will favor it with my investment, with my visits, I'll buy its products, I'll hire its people, I'll listen to its government, I'll consume its culture. Do I feel happy that Russia exists? No, not really. I have a sense that Russia is uh, perturbing the international weather, uh, that it's causing problems internationally. Therefore, I'm so much less likely to invest in the Russian economy now or for many years to come, to hire a Russian person, to buy a Russian product, and so on and so forth. So in the end, it boils down to this really very, very simple equation that if countries want to do well, because they want more foreign income, they want more investment, they have to do good. They have to seriously, systematically, and over a long period, demonstrate that they are able to harmonize their domestic and their international responsibilities. In other words, they can pull off that difficult trick of doing the right thing for their own people and doing the right thing for their own territory while doing no harm and preferably doing good to other people and other territories around the world. That, I believe, is the gold standard of good governance in the 21st century. And the, the Nordic countries in particular seem to do the best job of this. They seem to do the best job of balancing their domestic and their international responsibilities. And the proof of that is that people know it, they sense it. Those countries not only have the best images relative to the size of their economies and all the rest of it, they also rank highest in my other survey, the Good Country Index, which you kindly mentioned before. So just very briefly to distinguish between those two, the Nation Brands Index measures the images of countries. It measures what, how people perceive them. The Good Country Index actually measures the behavior of countries and specifically the positive or negative impacts that countries have on the world outside their own borders, on humanity and the planet. And so the countries that rank high in the Good Country Index, again, notably the, the, the the Nordic countries are the ones which in reality do the best job of contributing something to humanity and the planet, whilst we imagine, we suppose, we hope, doing the right thing for their own people. And that correlates with their images to a very, very high degree, more than 80%. So <laughs> the, the conclusion of all of this rather uh, tangled explanation is quite simply, as I said before, if a country wants to do well, it has to do good. It has to do it systematically and over a long period. Now, the good news is that that's cheap. Um, it's about policies. Sometimes those policies may have ramifications, but it certainly doesn't mean that you have to spend uh, hundreds of millions of dollars on bragging about how wonderful you are, because that really doesn't work. Um, if that formula sounds familiar to anybody, that's because it is. It's something that companies discovered a very long time ago. It used to be known as corporate social responsibility. Now it's known as uh, ESG, Environmental, Social and Governance Responsibility. The point being that if a company wants its customers to admire it, it has to contribute to the society in which it lives. And basically what my research has shown over the, over the last 20 years is that exactly the same equation works for countries and cities and regions as it does for companies. So corporate social responsibility for countries works just as hard as corporate social responsibility for companies. And why wouldn't it? Because it's the same audience exercising the same moral and ethical uh, decisions and judgments on countries and cities and regions as it does on companies and their products. So uh, Canadian teenagers who refuse to buy 
uh, I don't know, uh, Adidas trainers because they don't like what they've heard about the conditions in the factories where those trainers are made in Bangladesh, for the same reason might decide not to go on holiday to Poland because they don't like what they've heard about the Polish government's stance on LGBTQ rights or something of that sort. So this is very good news because it means that the moral majority, the ordinary consumers around the world are actually forcing and obliging governments to take the more ethical, the more sharing, the more collaborative route. Selfish, self-interested governance is no longer the way to do it. And countries will be punished by public opinion if that's what they try to do. This in fact is really, really good news. And it's one of the reasons why I'm unfashionably a little bit hopeful at the moment. Um, because I think more and more countries, and particularly the, the Nordic countries, have clearly begun to discover that this is the way forward, this is the climate, and this is the way that people and countries are beginning to operate today. I'll stop at that point. Thank you, Simon. Um, I see that there's already a question in the chat, and I can say that I forgot in the beginning to, to mention that if anybody has any questions, you're welcome to post it in the chat. And then when we're finished with the presentations, uh, we'll have a Q&A session. Um, so speaking about positive perceptions between countries, and I didn't arrange this uh, webinar because of the current um, the current visit from the Prime Minister Modi from India in Denmark. But um, maybe with that in mind, we can ask uh, Klaus, could you take us into the sort of dip diplomatic and strategic engine room of, of the Danish Ministry of Foreign Affairs? And how do you practically work with soft power and public diplomacy? So I can do that. Uh, I'd like to make, make four points. I think we need to have just you know one minute of theory, which is the definition of public diplomacy, at least the way I see it. And then I will comment on Simon's <clears throat> point about bragging about um, a good country, because I'm an ambassador from a darling country, I can tell you, but I'll come back to that. And um, then I would also, um, in my last point, uh, touch on why Western values have not prevailed in autocracies. So these four points. So starting with the definition, I was uh, called when I was ambassador in Singapore. I was called by the foreign office HR uh, people who who asked me if I wanted to come back to establish this public diplomacy department. And I said, "What is it?" And he said, "I don't know, but I think it's something with communication." So I guess he was right about that. But then I had to study Simon and Joseph Nye uh, of Howard and others in order to find out what it's all about. And in my perception, public diplomacy is uh, something that you need to see in relation to, to classic diplomacy. So first of all, the headline is influence. This is why what diplomacy is, is for influence in a broader sense. So uh, the classic diplomacy is uh, a country's way of trying to influence state uh, players in, in, in other countries like meaning governments and MPs and bureaucrats and uh, re regional bodies and representatives and so on. This is what we all know, and that was established um, uh, very much in 1814 by the Vienna Convention, which laid down the rules for this. So that was classic diplomacy. Then public diplomacy is our attempt to influence non-state players in other countries. And these non-state players have gained more influence over the years. This is why it's important for for foreign offices to deal with it and to countries to deal with it. And they are media and think tanks and uh, businesses and NGOs and uh, individuals like uh, Thunberg or the Pope or Nelson Mandela, people like that. So this is the distinction between classic and, and public diplomacy. And, and overall, there's this general effort which covers classic diplomacy and public diplomacy, which is our effort to brand the nation. So nation branding is, the, is also a part of the definition of public diplomacy. It's a more general, generalized effort. So that was the definition. Now, um, branding a good country, commenting on what Simon said. Uh, when I tell Greeks that I am I'm an ambassador to Athens right now, and when I tell uh, Greeks that I'm from Denmark, I see the smile on their face. It's like they, uh, I promised them you know, um, a ride in Tivoli in Copenhagen or something like that. And uh, 
so I, I, uh, I, was, I was looking a little bit into this and I, and I noticed that the prime minister once said he wanted to make Greece Denmark of the Mediterranean. And they also experienced that in, in Paris uh, where people whom I uh, talked to start asking questions about Denmark and uh, Balkan and uh, our welfare system and flexicurities and all that. And um, that led me to think uh, about uh, some of my colleagues who used to brag very much about uh, Denmark also with the purpose of trying to um, impose on other countries what solutions they should try to implement in their countries. I know, you know, in, in, in Brussels, where I also served, in, in working parties, people say, we in Denmark always, and then they, they, they try to describe the Danish water protection system or another good solution of, of ours. But, but I always said, you cannot do that because first of all, it, it gives the impression of propaganda. And, and secondly, and perhaps most importantly, um, they come from other points of departure. You cannot say to, to France, why don't you introduce food security? Because they do not have this relationship between the government, the labor unions and the employers. It, it's completely unthinkable that these people could ever cooperate. So, so you cannot just uh, parallel the solutions of a good country like Denmark in, onto other countries. So that certainly doesn't work at all. Um, then the, the next um, point I would like to make, this is the thing about um, creating a, an image and, and, and rather to, to how can you harm an image? How can you harm a brand? Is that at all, of all, at all possible to, to harm a nation brand? Which Simon says would uh, take a long time. So I tested his, uh, his uh, theory way back uh, after the second cartoons issue, Mohammed cartoons issue in Denmark, the so-called reprinting crisis of 2008, where these uh, uh, cartoons were reprinted in the Danish press covering the arrest of somebody who tried to kill the cartoonist Vestergaard at that time. Uh, and it, it was actually worse than the first time because we has, had a huge boycott against Danish products. We had uh, assaults on, on Danes uh, in, the, in the Islamic world. And um, we had a lot of bad uh, image uh, covering in, in other countries. So uh, when it calmed down, uh, after all, and uh, the Dutch, uh, there was a Dutch um, racist, uh, whom you all know, who, who uh, helped us a little bit with that. So, so we could condemn him. And so the, the light was on, on the Netherlands more than on Denmark. So that was the reason it, it calmed down a little bit. I went to Syria, to Damascus, uh, literally, going out of the car, uh, talking to random people in the street. It was at the refugee camp uh, downtown in Damascus. I went into shops and I said, hello, I'm, the, I'm, I'm a Danish ambassador. What do you think about that? And uh, most of them said, um, we are very, I, I was afraid they were angry at, at, at me or at Denmark. They said, we are not angry. We are very saddened by what you did. Why, why do you have to uh, insult our the prophet, you have wealth, you have this welfare system, you come from a good country. What, what do you also have to, 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 uh, to, to do this to our, our prophet? Because we are not in a very good state compared to you. Some of them even asked me to take a walk because they're afraid of, of the, the security services listening to them. And uh, so they were very, they were, they were saddened uh, by this. But then they said, but I also know that my neighbor's uh, aunt's uh, neighbor's cousin uh, actually uh, works in Denmark. And he says, it's a lovely country. And I also heard that. So that you have justice and human rights and, and uh, you're a rich country. And uh, I would like to go there as well. So I, I, I invented this uh, notion of a split brand. But it was certainly clear that Denmark's brand was not harmed in, in a fundamental way. Now, Simon says he can see in his polls that that we are, we are, it's still, we are, it has really harmed Denmark. And there's still some re reminiscence of this in, in, the, uh, in the Arab world. But I can say, tell that the trade has gone back and that we don't report any, uh, on very, not very many incidents against uh, Danes in the Muslim uh, world. So the point is, it's, you cannot build a brand uh, quickly, but you can, it's certainly also very difficult to, to smash a brand overnight, really, although we did our best, probably. Um, then the last point I would like to make, this is uh, linking to the actual crisis in, in, uh, in, in Russia and, uh, and Ukraine and the Ukrainian issue. 
when we look back, uh, when globalization took off for, for real in, 19, in the middle of the 90s, I would say, the establishment of the World Trade Organization, um, we thought that the, the closer contact between uh, autocracies like China uh, and Russia, but also other countries like India and uh, countries in Southeast Asia, would lead to um, these countries adapting the West the Western values. That would be because it would, first of all, it led to a, wealth, a rise in welfare. And so the middle class was established very broadly. And normally that would lead to people concentrating on soft policy values and demo, excuse me, democracy and the uh, uh, social systems and health and so on. And the, the means would be the media, the communication. First it was uh, telefax and it was the email and, and later on the, the social uh, platforms, but it really didn't uh, happen as you as you now can see. Uh, although they they obtained this level of richness, but but the problem is that we didn't see that these autocracies also used uh, the social media to to uh, fight this development and to gain control. And they, they did that in many ways. They did it actually actually through censorship and misinformation through uh, internet trolls and, and other means. And also passively, passively by simply shutting down uh, critical media and, and Western so many platforms. So um, we we, uh, we we underestimated uh, what kind of power these autocracies had vis-a-vis -vis our attempts to, uh, to 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 have them adopt our values. So you can say now that uh, we didn't prevail, and there's an outright war going on right now. Uh, on public diplomacy means through the social platforms. Thank you, Klaus. Um, then I would like to ask Camilla Morhost, um, what, uh, what are your strategic thoughts working in the, the Danish Cultural Institute around the world? And, and why do you think cultural diplomacy is important? <laughs> Why should we think that cultural diplomacy is important? I think you're muted. Thank you. Thank you for, for, for this presentation and the previous presentation. I think I'm constantly getting more um, uh, getting more understanding of the field of cultural diplomacy, even though that we we work in that field, and and what I hear also is that there are so many uh, different uh, kind of uh, trying to grasping the field because it is of course right as Carl said that public diplomacy is another way of making influence for uh, for for no state players. And of course, as Simon said, it is also and has been a lot about nation branding. But I think I'm, uh, and for our perspective at the Danish Cultural Institute, we were founded on another ground because we were founded in the 1940s on a lot of uh, uh, concerns about how the development uh, Europe was facing in a very tense situation at just a few steps from a full-scale conflict and a full-grown uh, uh, war. So what, but, so, so what we were founded on was to create understanding across borders through art and culture and to assist that cultures can learn from each other. And in that respect, that the Danish society and culture had something to offer. So actually it was not so much to seeking to have this one way approach of just going out in the world and, and, and making a lesson for everybody else to learn how wonderful Denmark was, but more to seek to fighting uh, stereotypes to meet on common grounds. Uh, um, of course we brought, of course our values with us and we do that still. But, but it has always been a, a way for us to, to, to build relations internationally through art and culture. And that's why, why is that important? The, the first of all is, as you both mentioned, that, that when you work through art and culture, you work on a different level than 
political diplomacy. And you can maintain relations even when countries are very strongly disagree on current political issues. We have done that a lot in Russia, where we have been in constant um, political, um, I'm not talking about the, the warm conflict now, but of course we have living in an environment where there was a lot of political discussion. But besides that, we had this common ground of, uh, of, of sharing a concern for the climate, um, uh, eager to address uh, creative uh, innovation and so on. And I think, and that's important if you want to disagree on a political level that you have, you know, a kind of stream open for another kind of meetings. And secondly, and that's of course the part of the first, is that I think cultural diplomacy can open for other type of, of conversations and meetings. And it can make people meet on equal grounds, especially when we are in countries where they are fighting uh, financial issues or security issues, then everybody has a lot of culture. So I think that if we make these meetings, we can meet in eye level at that, in, in that area. And that's extremely important. And of course, and, and that's the most important part that, uh, that, that I think that when we work, uh, work uh, through art and culture, we grasp some of the deepest we human possesses, namely our identity. I mean, we are working with storytelling, songs, literature, pictures, uh, imag uh, imaginations. So actually we are directly addressing how we understand ourselves, our history and each other. I mean, are we old friends or old enemies? Are we totally different? Or do we share, have something we share? So I think it's, it's not just a, a cultural diplomacy, it's not just a sophisticated way to promote own values. It is, it can be, but it is also a, really a fair way to collaborate on, on another ground. At least that's what we are trying. Um, and that's why you will find Danish Cultural Institute in countries which are very important for Denmark, but where we have very different opinions about a lot of political issues. Um, that's why we have been for 20 years in Russia, and I will turn to that. And that's why we are now in China, in India, in Turkey, in Brazil. Uh, and, 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 and we have we had a very strong presence in the Eastern Partnership countries, in Ukraine, for example, where we should have opened the youth house. Um, it is because we want to have this building relation uh, on common grounds. Um, but of course, there is a limitation. And the limitation comes when we have we go from different opinions and we have issues to have a conflict. And when we are in a, in a conflicting situation right now with Russia, we can't have at the same time building relation and fighting each other. Uh, even though that it's not directly. And that's why we have uh, stopped our activities at the moment in Russia. Um, also because we have to have, um, we have to be very firm that our approach is to build the relations and not to destroy it. So there's time for us to be there and a time for us to pause and, uh, and to have a stop. And I can say for the Danish Cultural Institute that that meant that for nearly 50 years we couldn't be in Poland because there were too many conflicts. They were on another side in the Cold War. But when we could, we returned to Poland and we have been here uh, there for a long time. And then we move on to Ukraine after, after Poland because uh, we think that was even more important. It was before the war and so on. But it's just to tell that for us, it is really a matter of a kind of collaboration. I know it's not all kind of cultural diplomacy that is kind of like us, but, uh, but I think this is for me, the, one of the strongest assets of cultural diplomacy that it actually can make this relation building a people to people meeting. And it's because it worked on another uh, tra tra uh, trajectory than the, the political formal uh, uh, relation building. So 
yeah, I can tell a lot about more about our, our all our projects and so on, but I will pause that and um and of course I'm very curious to to hear a lot more. Thank you. Thank you, Camilla. Um, very interesting perspectives. Um, how, because what we haven't talked much about is, like, you, you guys have mentioned nation branding, you've mentioned cultural exchange, um, but Camilla, could you talk a bit about the work with civil society? So the work between state and civil society, how does that work with you in the Cultural Danish Institute? Yes, um, well, um, of course, we bring our uh, values with us everywhere we work in the world. Sometimes it is in a broad palette and sometimes we have programs where are very specific, for example, to promote democracy. We have to agree with the states that it is important to promote democracy. And now I will turn to the question and how do you promote and how do you build democracy in states? You do that through a strong civil society. You really need it. You, you need to have not just a free press, not just, um, not just an active uh, artistic life, uh, um, but you have to have a lot of small organization with a, a, a manifold of approaches. So, so that is our main purpose in the, um, in the Eastern Partnership countries that we work with the civil society uh, together with them uh, and the institutions to build all the small institution uh, together and make projects that shows that, uh, that this is a way to make a, a democracy work in real. It is not uh, just a, 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 um, a question of legislation, it is actually the, just a small part of it. Um, and it also the civil society that have to, you have to find the resistance there when, when things are going in a more uh, out of tragic way. Um, this is the only way I think. But, uh, but the, so we work very directly in some countries, in other countries like in China, we can of course talk so much about democracy because we are very strongly disagree about if that's the way to go, but what we can talk about is an active civil society. And for us, that would be the way, the road to democracy. So, but we can meet on that ground and not the other. And then we will go, of course, in a ground where we can meet with the, with the Chinese organizations and the artists and cultural people and so on. Just to have one example. Thank you. Um, just a reminder, if you have any questions, I see one question here. Um, that's a more practical question, but I'll ask it anyway to you, Camilla. Um, are you part of the foreign ministry or the Ministry of Culture? Or neither, maybe? <laughs> that is a very nice question. In You know, every uh, EU country has its own uh, cultural institute. And the most of them are actually part of the Minister of Foreign Affairs, but we are part of the Minister of Culture. We are uh, a self-governing institution. We have our own board. And in our, in our council, uh, we have both uh, representatives from the Minister of Foreign Affairs and the Minister of Culture. Uh, but we have formally, we are uh, with, in line with the Minister of Culture. Uh, for our perspective. That said, we we get even more funding from the Minister of Foreign Affairs than from the Minister of Culture. So, so we are, you know, in between and I have a lot of fruitful dialogue with the ambassadors where we work. Um, and uh, so, so we are in, in the middle of that. And I think that is very fruitful because they have always, the Minister of Foreign Affairs and all the ambassadors around the world, they have always to follow the current policy of the of, 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 of Denmark. And we we can work, we are never working against it, but we can work on the long term. I mean that's that's so we can we can work together uh, in a very sophisticated way with the Minister of Foreign Affairs, I think so. And we're always working for the long term. Thank you. Uh, I see someone raised their hand. Uh, just write your question in the chat, and then we'll uh, we'll uh, we'll forward it to the the panel. Um, I have a question here to address 
mainly to Klaus and Camilla, pointing to the statement that we can't build relations through uh, public diplomacy culture in crisis, conflict, war. How do you see that public diplomacy plays a role in the current situation? And I'm guessing the current situation is the, is the war in Ukraine. Who would you like to start? Okay, I start. Okay, I went. I, well, well, uh, um, you know, we should have had the keys to our new youth house in Kiev the 24th of February. It was really, I mean, we never get, got the keys, but it was so close that we should have opened the house. And of course, there was a, a war in Ukraine going on, but we could work there. And when I tell you that, that's because we can be very close to a conflict, but of course, we can't be in the middle of it. It's not a problem with the Ukraine people now that we don't share relations. It's for, of course for security reasons we can't be in Ukraine at the moment. But the second there would be a stabilizing situation, then we will return. And that would not be the same question in Russia. It is much far more complicated because because we have we are in a conflict with them. I mean, so so we have to wait. I think for a very long time to return to Russia, unfortunately, because we have to stabilize the situation so much that the government from both sides will say, now we want to rebuild our relation culturally together. And um, so I think that will take some time, but in Ukraine, we can go in the second, we have uh, the security situation, it's okay. Have you want me to chip in here? Yes. Um, yes. Um, of course, uh, the Denmark can play a limited role in, in, in changing the, the public opinion of Russia for several reasons. First of all, Denmark is a very small player. And when, when I said we about trying to influence autocracies uh, like China and Russia, I really meant the Western world. Uh, but the situation now is that very many, very many media have, have been closed down by the Russian authorities. Uh, but we know that we can, uh, that people in Russia can get um, uh, access to through VPN and, and, and other means uh, to uh, Western uh, social media. But we should also be careful here because it would be wrong to think that all of Russia uh, live the lives that we do. And a lot of people in Russia live in the countryside and they are not very much um, uh, um, influenced by the war, and these people, a lot of them do not have access to the internet. So we are mainly talking about the middle class and the major cities of Russia. Uh, and, um, but but uh, they, they would probably be able to themselves to circumvent the restrictions of the Russian authorities uh, to, and then to access the, the media. Uh, I would guess that the, the ones in, in Again, referring to what Simon says, that, uh, the ones in Russia who know Denmark would have a, a rather positive uh, impression. And I was asked earlier on by somebody, is it easier to become to be an ambassador uh, from a good country? And it certainly is. Uh, I can get access to ministers, as I see it, easier than, than at least other uh, EU partners can. They're very interested in, in all our solutions in, in energy and digital and media, uh, sorry, in health and uh, the welfare system and all, and all of the, uh, the rest there. So, so I guess Denmark has a good re reputation in Russia. Talk about uh, Ukraine, I mean, it's difficult to measure, but again, uh, there are actually uh, some signs that uh, we have a, quite a good standing in, in Ukraine. And we have had, had the visit of the prime minister, the visit of the foreign minister, the visit of the minister for development assistance, uh, uh, Zelensky has, has talked to our parliament, he would talk again to Danish uh, audience tomorrow night and so on. So there that, that seemed to be quite an interest from Ukraine in what Denmark can contribute with, not least in terms of reconstruction of the, um, the country, but, uh, but certainly also in, in with respect to Ukraine, get this impression that, that Denmark has a good reputation built up over many years, as Simon also uh, mentioned. Thank you, Klaus. Um, then I have a question, and that's regarding the current visitor, uh, Prime Minister Modi, who is in, in, in Denmark, and this whole 
public diplomacy, diplomacy, diplomatic relations between Denmark and India. When I grew up, my perception of the relationship between Denmark and India was that there was some negative perceptions, mainly towards Denmark in India. Um, and to my surprise, in the last decade or so, perhaps a shorter time, um, Denmark has done a lot of uh, good work in India with the embassy in, Denmark, uh, in, in New Delhi. Good just to the panel in general, um, because now we see that there's also a cultural exchange program following uh, these trade agreements and Denmark is exporting green. Uh, green skills and green diplomacy. Uh, what is how 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 is the case of Denmark and India sort of manifested in all of these discussions about nation branding and diplomacy and cultural diplomacy? And anyone can 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 answer this. I would like to hear Simon about how how uh, high are India on the level the good level index? I'm curious. And, yeah. I can't. Uh, I can't reply to the specific question of India and Denmark because I don't have the. I don't have the data in my head. Um, there's um, over a billion data points in this survey, as I said, and I can't. I can't normally remember them off the top of my head. Um, but um, as I said, there is a direct correlation uh, between uh, the positive impacts that countries have outside their borders. Uh, and how highly people regard that country. And the perceptions of Indians um, are no exception to that rule. They like the countries that do good in the world and they dislike the countries that do harm. The, one of the things that I've discovered, and this is taking us back to the, the question of, the, of the, the conflict in Ukraine at the moment. The one thing I have discovered is that public opinion is absolutely intolerant of conflict. It is the one thing that public opinion cannot stomach. And curiously, um, international public opinion, if you can talk about such a thing, isn't even all that sensitive to who is responsible for the conflict. It is to some degree, when, it, when there's very plainly an aggressor, as is the case with, uh, with, with Russia and UK, Ukraine, sure. But generally speaking, if you look at a conflict like, for example, Israel-Palestine, what you tend to see is that international public opinion is very firmly against both countries. Um, and that's not because they think that one is to blame more or less than the other. It's because people cannot bear the idea of conflict. They can't bear the idea of nations fighting. And um, I suppose, I, I don't want to sound trivial about this, but if you wanted a recipe for how to damage your image, then that would be the way to do it. You'd have to go out and either um, insult or offend or harm somebody outside your own borders um, or, or, or basically go to war. That's the, way that, that's the way that it works. The other thing that you can do, and China has just discovered this, is to be associated with a pandemic. Um, a lot of people have uh, said to me since the pandemic, how has this impacted the images of countries? And the simple answer is not at all, because the pandemic is regarded as being a domestic phenomenon, a multi-domestic phenomenon, and people are not interested in what goes on domestically in other countries. Um, but what we do find is that China alone dropped in the overall ranking of the Nation Brands Index by a staggering amount, about 13 places, which is completely unprecedented. And that is simply because a large number of people around the world think that the pandemic is China's fault. Um, and it's really as simple as that. All the other countries, the ones that manage slightly better, the ones that manage slightly worse, all of that is completely ignored. Nobody appears to have any idea um, how well certain countries have managed the pandemic or how badly others have managed it. In fact, what seems to happen is that people's expectations of how a country will handle the pandemic forms their image. So for example, there were phases during the pandemic where Sweden didn't seem to be handling it too well, but everybody in the world thought that Sweden was handling it really well because they expected Sweden to handle it really well. And that tends to be the way that these things work. And this is why it's so tempting to talk about brand images, because if your positive brand image is there, it's basically going to make people think positive things about you, even for a time, if you don't deserve it. For a time, not forever, but for a time. I can also add that if you look at, at uh, India, um, 
William, you're actually very young, but Denmark used to have a good brand in India because of the need of our international development assistance. Mm -hmm. uh, but we actually, uh, India wanted to define itself as a non-development country, so we, we pulled out our assistance. But uh, the, for the last 20 years, uh, the relationship has been characterized by the Nils Hulk case. Uh, Nils Hulk uh, was sentenced to life in India in absentia for throwing down uh, four tons of weapons uh, into the Western Bengal. And um, Denmark refuses to extradite him. Uh, that has been a huge uh, crisis between India and Denmark for many years. But again, this is an example of a split brand because the Prime Minister was asked the question today, did you discuss with President Modi in Copenhagen today, did you discuss the Nils Hulk case? And she said, no, we didn't. Are you going to? No, we are not. This is handled in a parallel track, she said because uh, it was clear from the comments by the, the commentators afterwards that this prime minister was not interested in, in having the constructive talks about uh, deals on green uh, transition and uh, export of, of Danish wind turbines and others and, and solar uh, to, to India uh, polluted by this case. So you sort of uh, park the uh, hog issue in a so-called parallel legal track um, and then you leave it out of the relationship between uh, India and Denmark. But, but I think if you ask the Indians uh, about Denmark, they would say, we don't like the Nils Hulk thing, he's a terrorist, he should be sentenced, you should extradite him. But Denmark is an okay country. So it, 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 again, it, it proves your point on Yes, it's certainly true that people can hold a large number of uh, conflicting or even contradictory views about countries in their minds at the same time. This is just a, a human skill. We have different uh, dials, different knobs in our head, and um, the sort of self-interest dial can be turned up to 10, whereas the political disapproval dial can be turned down to zero. I mean, I distinctly remember doing a series of interviews with young people in uh, Afghanistan, where I asked them about America, and I said, what do you think about America? And a lot of these kids would say really quite chilling things in response to that direct question. They would say, um, I'd like to get a pilot's license so I could so I could fly a plane into another building sometime. And then you, the interview finishes and you sit down and I say to the guy, so Mohammed, what do you want to do um, when you when you finish your studies? Oh, I want to go to uh, to Harvard and um, uh, and get venture capital and start a business and go on Wall Street and be a millionaire. And those 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 two perceptions of the country exist quite happily um, in people's minds very often at the same time. Um, and why shouldn't they? Because countries are complicated things. And people like us who sit around talking about countries as if they were single, simple entities whose behavior you could describe in simple terms, we're the ones who are wrong. Countries are ineffably complex and very often contradictory. But I, I, just, I, I just wanted to say one more thing because it really struck me when Camilla was speaking about the uh, origins of, the, of, of Danish uh, cultural relations, that description of how in the 1940s Denmark went out into the world, not trying to promote its interests, not trying to do good, but wonder, uh, not, not trying to benefit itself, but trying to do good, wondering what it could do for the world. And it just made me think the difference between a country that quite naturally thinks in terms of going out to the world and seeing how much good it can do, and the vast majority of countries that go out into the world looking for advantage. And I think it's a really interesting question, which countries and which politicians and which governments and which individuals in which countries tend to instinctively look for collective, the collective benefit of humanity and which are the ones that look to the selfish benefit of their own populations or even part of their own population? And how does that difference come about? What determines that? I think it's a really important question. I think one element here is also that uh, the answer to the question is it's mainly smaller countries who don't appear to be any military or, or hard power threat to anyone. They, they, I would guess that they had an easier go in being a good country than, than bigger ones. But there's still plenty of small, the majority of smaller countries still want to, to seize economic advantage, even if they even if they're for very sensibly don't want to declare war on anybody. The idea is, I mean, many, many smaller countries that I've worked for are stuck in this mindset of the international community as being a place where you go and achieve ascendancy over other countries. And the whole construct of soft power is about achieving ascendancy over other countries. How can we win? How can we beat the others? 
And it seems to me that this is just incredibly outdated and actually suicidal. So how can, how can we bring about that change in the fundamental of culture of governance that instead of just constantly asking, how can we seize advantage, we encourage governments of the future and populations of the future to start asking, how can we do some good for ourselves and for everybody else? And this is where the Nordic countries, I think, show sometimes, not all the time, but show some pretty good attitudes, very few others. Okay, um, we have time for one last question and it's quite long. And before I start reading it out loud, um, I also want to mention that uh, Simon has sent, um, okay, we can't share the PDF, um, but Simon has uh, generously agreed that uh, he would share his uh, recent book, The Good Country uh, Equation. Um, so if you send us an email, then uh, probably that's the way to go. Uh, that's addressed for the audience. And then we'll, uh, we'll be able to forward it to you that way. But um, yes, ulnris at ulnris.dk and it's in the chat. Um, so a last question and it's quite long. So we are two history students from the University of Copenhagen writing our master thesis about state, nation and democracy building during the Vietnam War and Afghanistan War. And we use soft power theory to prove why it went wrong both places. And here comes the question. How would you distinguish between state and nation building and what are your comments on cultural diplomacy and nation building combined with traditional warfare. And that's for everyone. I appoint Klaus to answer that one. Well, um, it was very clear. Well, I, the exam, okay, that, and one example is the, the, our efforts in, in Iraq um, in the beginning of the 2000s when there was this notion that we, by means of hard power, could uh, introduce a new system, uh, undertake re regime change, and then uh, the, the knowledge about the soft values and the advantages of the best Western values and democracy would prevail and everybody would be happy getting rid of Saddam, and then they would uh, cheer democracy and everything would be fine. And again, we were just totally wrong. Uh, we, we, we tried to deduct from our own point of departure where we came from, how the interactions would uh, react, and but they didn't at all. So uh, that was a good example that um, uh, even though uh, there was a certain image of the West in, in that country, it was certainly not uh, an image that, that uh, was so strong that people were interested in changing their own countries into becoming a Western liberal democracy. If I just could add here on the last, that I think Simon beautifully have, have uh, told us about how, how strong it is, uh, the, the power of soft power. And, 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 and it can even, you know, fight uh, facts and, and, and uh, difficulties. And I said, when looking after a warfare, open conflict, uh, how are the relations between the nation afterwards if they try to fight each other for a specific way to go. And how is it with soft diplomacy? I mean, when we look back, for example, at the Baltic states now, from uh, the Danish perspective, we went there culturally in a very difficult situation 30 years ago. And still we are in the, the most important building in the Riga. We, are, we have our institute there because they are so thankful that we, we went there in a very difficult situation where they were very afraid, and now we know why, uh, from, uh, for, for the, the old Russia. So, so if you want to, to make long lasting relation, I think that you really have to consider how to use the soft power, how to use the cultural diplomacy in that relation, because that would last and the other won't. I, I absolutely second that. I, I've often said that cultural relations is the only truly effective form of nation branding that exists. It's, it's very slow. Um, it takes a long, long time to create. It's very cheap. 
um, but you need a lot of very, very dedicated and very skilled people to do it. But in the end, you achieve a remarkable result. It means that you've got two countries who can't hate each other. Um, you can hate what they do, but you can't hate them. And perhaps the, the, the best, most comprehensive example I know from history was the Elysee Accord between, uh, b between the French and the Germans um, in, in the 1960s, the De Gaulle Adenauer Pact, which consisted not only of cultural relations, but every kind of uh, relationship building that could be conceived between the French and the Germans. And they decided they were going to put an end to the enmity, enmity between these two European nations, which had existed for centuries. And it took a long, long time and it cost an enormous amount of money because it wasn't just cultural relations, but it did work. And even today, when I look at the Nation Brands Index and I look at French people's views of anything to do with Germany, or I look at German people's views of anything to do with France, they rank each other very near the top. And uh, before the 1960s, that would have been absolutely inconceivable. So this stuff works. The problem is that uh, governments are seldom in office for long enough to see the benefits of doing it properly. And with that last remark, uh, I would like to thank you, uh, today's panel, for participating. Thank you to uh, Camilla, Klaus, and, uh, and Simon, and very interesting uh, insights and perspectives. And <clears throat> we, what I take away from this is that we need to con continue cultural diplomacy and public diplomacy and uh, building cultural relations and exchange culture. So, um, and I know that you will all, <laughs> all uh, keep on doing that. So thank you for today and uh, hopefully see you at another uh, webinar or event here at the Danish Foreign Policy Society. <laughs>